In today's video, I will try to design an RC plane from scratch. We will go from the requirements to a rough sketch to geometry and power specification. This is just one way of going about designing an RC aircraft, and it is not the only way. Let's get started. Step 1. Requirements In this step, the goal is to decide what we want our plane to do. What type of plane is it? How big should it be? How fast and how long should it fly? And any other requirements we want such as a hand launchable model or a plane with floats. For this design exercise, I have used the following general requirements. I want to design a sport style RC plane, but it should not be too difficult to fly. The plane should be large but not be too big and I am putting a constraint of 1.5 meter wingspan on it because it would be easy to store and transport. Also, the plane would be made using EPO foam, just like most RC models out there. It would be electrically powered. It is okay if all requirements are not known now. We can add and adjust other requirements as we proceed. Step 2. Study aircraft of the same class. In this step, we look at other aircraft that fit our requirements to get an idea of what our design be like in terms of weight, looks, configuration, etc. We know that we are looking for sport RC planes with a wingspan of not more than 1.5 meter that are primarily made from EPO foam. This requires some research. You can find such planes at the website of manufacturers. You can also use a tool like Perplexity to quickly gather some data. Here are some similar models that I found. I have compiled the data of similar models in this list. We will add more information about the planes in this Excel file in the next step. Step 3. Selecting the wing loading. For most RC plane models, we can find the wing area or the wing loading stated in the product specification. I was able to get the wing area or wing loading data for all these aircraft except for the E-Flight Commander. So, I used its reference image in the Onshape CAD software and set the width of the image equal to the wingspan of the plane. If the image is cropped correctly, the length of the image should be almost equal to the length of the plane. Then, I traced the wing and calculated the area from there. Now, I could calculate the wing loading, if not already mentioned in the plane specification, by using the simple formula shown on the screen. Look at the wing loading values. They tend to be around 5.5 to 6 kg per square meter. For our design, I use the average value of 5.81. Step 4. Estimate total weight. For now, we could only make a guess at the total weight of our plane because we don't know what battery, ESC motor, etc. we will need to carry. I think the E-Flight RV7 is a good reference plane for our design, and so I will use the value of 1.4 kilograms as our design's estimated total weight. Step 5. Draw initial sketches. We already know a lot about our design, and we haven't even drawn the sketch yet. Now is the time to sketch initial configurations, evaluate pros and cons, and select a candidate. For example, our design could potentially be anything from a conventional design to a canard plane to a flying wing. We could have a puller, or a pusher, or even a twin motor configuration. We could use a conventional tail, V-tail, or T-tail. We could have retractable or fixed landing gear. For this design, I want it to be as simple as possible. So, I am choosing a conventional design with fixed landing gear. This is a rough sketch of how I want my plane to look like. It is a low-wing conventional aircraft with fixed tail dragger type landing gear and a puller propeller. Step 6. Wing Design Now that we know the wing loading and weight of our design, we can calculate the wing area required by using this formula. Next, we need to choose the aspect ratio. Gliders have high aspect ratio wings, then come trainers, then sport and then military aircraft models. For a sport style plane, an aspect ratio of about 5 to 6 could be used. Let's select 5 as the aspect ratio for this design. We also need to select the wing planform and taper ratio. The different wing planforms are explained in one of my previous videos on wing design. For this design let's select a straight and tapered wing for relative ease of making and a good lift distribution. Taper ratio values for such wings generally range from 0.4 to 0.6. Let's use 0.5 as the taper ratio. 
With this information, we can now calculate the wingspan, root chord, tip chord, and mean aerodynamic chord of our wing using the given formulas. I like to use a spreadsheet with the formulas embedded in the relevant cells so that I can quickly change and iterate upon the design later. Now we come to the first thing that we will do to make the airplane stable. We need to design the airplane so that its center of gravity and the wing are in the right location with respect to each other. We do this by using the mean aerodynamic chord or Mach value we calculated. You can think of the Mach like this. The entire wing tends to act as if all its area were concentrated at the Mach. For an airfoil by itself, the point of neutral stability is 25% of Mach back from the leading edge. So, for a wing, the point of neutral stability is 25% of Mach back from the leading edge of the Mach. We will find this point on our drawing and mark it like this. If our airplane didn't have a fuselage or tail, and the CG was located at exactly the 25% Mach point, it would be neutrally stable. When we add an aft tail, the airplane gets more stable. So now we know where we would need to place our CG on the airplane. This makes our plane stable in pitch. We also need to have some roll stability. This can be done by adding a dihedral to the wing. Typical dihedral values are given here. For our design, we will choose a 3 degree dihedral. Another crucial step is the airfoil selection. I have discussed a few tips in a previous video. For a sport style plane, we need a moderately cambered airfoil to give us a good value for the maximum lift coefficient and reasonable value for the pitching moment. This type of airfoil will also give us a gentle stall characteristic. We can calculate the lift coefficient required in cruise by using our wing loading value in this formula. Here, Q is the dynamic pressure, which is calculated using this formula. If we use a cruise speed of 16 meters per second, this gives a cruise lift coefficient of about 0.38. Based on this information, for this design, we could go with the NACA 2412 airfoil. We normally place the wing to some incidence angle to the fuselage. We try to set the airfoils so that they are at the correct angle of attack for creating the required lift during cruise with the fuselage at zero angle of attack to minimize drag. We can find the angle of attack required in degrees using this formula. Here, alpha zero lift comes from the airfoil data. It is the angle where the airfoil produces no lift. For cambered airfoils, this value is negative. For example, for the NACA 2412, the zero lift angle is about minus 2.5 degrees. This formula yields a value of 2.6 degrees as the angle of incidence. The maximum lift coefficient also affects our plane stall speed. We can use this formula to calculate the stall speed. If the stall speed is too high, we can consider adding flaps to increase the maximum lift. The landing speed is typically 20% higher than the stall speed. We need to make sure that there is a healthy margin between our chosen cruise speed and stall speed for a safe flight. Step 7. Motor ESC and battery selection. As I have mentioned in a previous video, I find the guide by RC Explain channel really helpful. For our design, I will walk through the steps given in the guide. For a better understanding of the process, the data used, and to understand where the guide is applicable, please watch the video by RC Explained. The link to the video is in the description. We first start by selecting the power to weight ratio of our design based on how we want it to perform. The typical power to weight ratios are given here. Based on this, the power to weight ratio is around 242 watt per kg for a sport style model. Now, we can calculate the wattage needed by multiplying this ratio by our plane's estimated gross weight. This gives us a value of 338.8 watt. Next, we select the cell count based on our wingspan. For our wingspan of about 1.1 meter or about 43 inches, the suggested cell count is 3S. This means we will need a 3S battery pack. Next, we find the nominal voltage. If we use a LiPo battery, the volt per cell value is 3.7. So, the nominal voltage will be 3.7 times our cell count of 3 giving 11.1 volt. We need to select the battery capacity based on the battery weight and the endurance we need. The higher the capacity, the more time we will be able to fly but the battery weight will also be higher. Our reference plane uses a 2200 to 3200 mAh battery pack, 
so I will choose the 2200 milliamp hour battery capacity for now. Next, the current can be calculated by dividing the wattage by the nominal voltage. We would need an ESC which can handle this current, but we also need a safety margin. Using a factor of safety of 1.2, we get the ESC max current. So now we know that the ESC must be capable of handling a 3S LiPo and a minimum of 37 amps for our plane. The C rating can be calculated using the shown formula. With all this information, we know the minimum specs of the battery and the ESC we will need. Then, we can calculate the recommended RPM using this formula where the wingspan is in inches. This gives us a recommended RPM of around 14,660 RPM. Using the RPM value, we can calculate the motor KV by dividing the RPM by the nominal voltage. This gives us a KV of around 1300 KV. Now we know that we need a motor with the at least the following specs, 340 watt power, 1300 KV and able to handle 31 amps. Of course, the motor does not need to be exactly with these values and could be different based on availability. The propeller diameter, and pitch can also be calculated using these formulas. The output values are in inches. The values for the RPM or KV and prop size depend on a trade-off. For example, we could use a lower RPM than the calculated value with a large propeller if we want more thrust. On the other hand, we could use a high RPM with a smaller prop if we want the plane to fly faster. So, this choice depends highly on the designer. In reality, the setup could be very different from the one we calculated now due to a number of causes such as overheating, flight time, etc. But this gives us a starting point to test our design with. If you know based on experience which combination of motor, ESC and battery will be good for your design, go ahead with that setup. Step 8. Tail Design Now we need to size the vertical and horizontal tail. For initial design, we could do this by using the tail volume coefficient method. What this means is that similar planes have a similar tail volume coefficient, and we use this value to calculate the size of our tail. We can calculate the horizontal and vertical tail areas for our design using these formulas. Typical values for these coefficients are shown here. To proceed further, we would need the tail moment arm values. The tail moment arm is the distance between the quarter cord points of the max of the wing and tail. We also need to select the aspect ratios and taper ratios for the horizontal and vertical tail. Again, we can use the typical value shown here. Tails usually have low aspect ratio values because we do not want the tail to stall at a high angle of attack and lose control of our tail control surfaces. The vertical tail plays a key role in spin recovery and the placement of the horizontal tail can hurt its effectiveness. In a spin, we need the rudder to stop the rotation, but if the horizontal tail is in the wrong place, it may block the air from getting to the rudder. Due to the extreme angle of attack on the horizontal tail during a spin, the rudder may experience a turbulent wake from the horizontal tail. For initial design, we can follow this process. Draw a line extending upwards from the horizontal tail's leading edge at 60 degrees. Do the same for the trailing edge, but at an angle of 30 degrees. Now shade the region of the rudder that gets covered within these two lines. We should make sure that at least a third of the rudder is not in the shaded region. We can move the horizontal tail front or back, or have a T-tail for better spin recovery. Be careful with the T-tail, as the horizontal tail could be in the wake of the wing, making the elevator ineffective during high angles of attack. For the control surfaces, we can look at similar planes to see the proportion of the tail occupied by the control surfaces. This gives us a good starting point to size the elevator and rudder. As explained in a previous video about nose heavy and tail heavy airplanes, there is a lot to consider depending on your particular design because the tail should be able to balance the moments created by various components of the aircraft. Step 9. Analysis. We can analyze the aircraft using some formulas or by using software like Mockup or XFLR5 or Aircraft Intuitive Design MATLAB app. Another way is to build the first version and test it. We can find out the top speed, stall angle, maneuverability, takeoff distance, etc. Step 10. Iterate. Aircraft design is an iterative process. 
Here is the first iteration summary of the geometry that we calculated today. It is said that we never build a dash one. Based on the analysis or test flight, we need to make the plane better in the areas where it lacks. We can try to minimize the drag or improve the stability. In this video, we went from the drawing board to the actual design of our RC aircraft. You can access the Excel file that I used in the video using the link in the description. Did you find this video informative? If you did, consider supporting the channel via a one-time contribution using the PayPal or buy me a coffee link in the description. If you want some more details regarding a particular step in this video, you can check out other videos from the channel. Thank you for watching.